Hey folks, this is James Tracy, MemoryHoleBlog.org, and uh, time for a news brief for the past week ending August 2nd. It is uh, August 1st, and there is so much stuff going on, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover all of it. But here are some of the stories that really did catch my eye over the past week. Zero Hedge, uh, first story, like nothing we've ever seen, imminent eviction wave is coming to these states. And it reads, this is dated the 29th of July. The eviction moratorium expired last Friday, nearly four months after the U.S. economy effectively shut down due to the COVID pandemic and more than 12 million renters, all behind on rent payments because of the virus-induced recession, are now at imminent risk of getting booted to the curb. This Friday, some this Friday that would be July 31st, some 25 million Americans will no longer receive their weekly $600 federal unemployment checks, and the next round of government handouts currently discussed by Republicans and Democrats could see benefits slashed from $600 to $200 or be nothing at all if no deal is reached in Congress. This would crush household finances across middle-class America, resulting in an even higher number of households unable to pay their rent bill, unable to pay their rent bill in the months ahead. Trump's top economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, still uh, is religiously pumping stocks with meaningless headlines anytime the S&P Standard & Poor's is even barely in the red. In late July, more than 31 million Americans collected unemployment benefits of some form The economic recovery reversed in late June as the next crisis among households looms. And said John Pollock of coordinator for the National Coalition for Civil Rights to Council, he says, it's nothing like we've ever seen. In 2016, there were 3.2 million evictions, Pollock said, and there could be that many evictions this coming August, uh, August of, of 2020. And last Sunday, food banks, re, food bank lines reemerged as people's benefits ran out. The number of jobless Americans is staggering and downright depressionary, suggesting no labor market recovery this year or next. Which brings us to the next story. This is um, an excerpt from a vlog by um, the um, precious metals and financial analyst Mike Maloney. Uh, who's talking about uh, uh, the pending uh, hyperinflation that uh, will be taking place over the next several months and likely years. Uh, This is something that these uh, gold and silver forecasters, prognosticators, uh, have been uh, talking about for the past decade or more, the likes of Peter Schiff and others. I think that I have a particular amount of respect for uh, Mike Maloney, uh, he's been at this game for a, a very long time and uh, I think is really a superior intellect. Just want to play a couple of minutes of this uh, so that he can provide his assessment. Gold and silver are absolutely on fire and today marks the day of the third and final phase of this bull market. This is the day it began. And the third phase is the phase of the greatest gains in the shortest period of time. Uh, When I say this bull market, what I'm talking about is this bull market actually started in the at the beginning of this century. And this is one giant bull market. Uh, The correction that we have been through the cyclical pullback. This is we we went from uh, the beginning of the century up to uh, 2011. And we've been in a pullback, a cyclical pullback in a secular bull market. So this cyclical bear, the bear portion ended in 2015. We've gone back up and today we broke out into all time record highs in the gold price measured in US dollars. But since gold has been setting records in almost every currency, I would imagine that today, I haven't checked, but I would imagine that today gold is setting records in almost all currencies on the planet. You know, all currencies fall at different rates compared to gold. You know, the dollar goes up and it goes down and other currencies go up and down. But when it comes to comparing them against gold over a long period of time, and we'll see this later in the video, they all go 
down and pause and down and pause. And they may go up a little over a short period of time, but over a long period of time, they just go down compared to gold. Uh, I think this will also be the case for a variety of cryptocurrencies, uh, not all of them, but uh, they will definitely stand up vis-a-vis uh, -vis the devaluation of the U.S. dollar. And as the, um, the, the um, civil unrest ensues in our country, I fear that we're going to have a lot of foreign investors who are looking at the United States and saying, we're going to pull our money, we're going to pull our resources out of any investments in the U.S. or U.S.-based companies for fear of a decline uh, in uh, simple law and order. And uh, we're going to be looked upon increasingly as a third world country uh, as the unrest ensues and the build up to uh, the, um, the coming election. And that brings us to the next story. Really, this is an opinion piece uh, from uh, Michael Snyder, published uh, July 26th, almost a week ago. America's major cities are being turned into war zones, and it is not going to end in November. Um, Snyder writes, the civil unrest that we witnessed all across America this weekend was extremely alarming. For a few weeks, it seemed like the chaos that erupted in the immediate aftermath of the tragic death of George Floyd was subsiding. But in recent days, there has been a dramatic resurgence within the last 48 hours. And he once again is writing of last weekend. Within the last 48 hours, there's been an eruptions of violence in major cities such as P Seattle, Portland, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. He goes on to say that... Um, People are writing him and uh, remarking that, well, and Democrats are saying the same thing. Well, this is will all subside when Trump is out of office, uh, uh, when when Biden, when our guy uh, is uh, is safely in office. But uh, Snyder disagrees that this is part of a broader trend. And a lot of the uh, BLM and Antifa protesters, these protesters on the left, are not satisfied with Joe Biden either as a uh, as, as a candidate for uh, for the Democratic Party. Snyder writes, it is important to understand that these riders are very serious about their goals and they aren't going to be happy with just a few half-hearted quote unquote reforms. For for many of them, nothing short of the overthrow of the entire system will suffice. Uh, Bernal Trammell, a black Donald Trump supporter, was reportedly shot and killed in Milwaukee on July 23rd. According to the uh, local uh, television news affiliate, the 60-year-old was gunned down during a drive-by shooting in the neighborhood where he was known for displaying signs reading Vote Trump 2020 and, and reciting Bible verses. So in other words, he uh, he had a, a, a spiritual firmament and uh, he was a, a Trump supporter and he was African-American. So he was uh, targeted uh, for a, a drive-by shooting. And this... Um, Snyder points out that this was not, this is not taking place in Los Angeles or New York or Portland or Seattle. It's taking place in the Midwest, in uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, continuing, a few related stories having to do with the civil unrest, which I really think is the top, um, the foremost issue uh, facing facing our country, as well as the lockdowns, which are clearly related. Um, LifeSite News, a story that came out uh, just uh, yesterday on Friday, July 31st, it points out how conservative commentators are criticizing Democrat elites for failing to observe so-called social distancing and other measures which they have insisted are necessary while at the funeral of Democratic congressman and civil rights uh, leader John Lewis. And there are all sorts of pictures going around social media on Twitter about how um, none of these people attending the services for John Lewis are social distancing. They're crowded together in pews. Now, granted, they have face masks on. And and yet, um, as this article points out, and in, in fact, um, former presidents Obama, Bush Jr., and uh, Bill Clinton were in attendance Images from the service shared to social media show a packed church with many members of the congregation not social distancing, a measure which has been insisted upon for churches around the country in response to the coronavirus crisis, 
which the Georgia state government says is currently required. Uh, most churches in a, the church that I attend, every other pew is roped off for the purposes of social distancing, and people are very careful about that. Um, that's here in South Florida, but that this is the case across the country, and of course in California, for example, one cannot even attend church. But there are a number of tweets here pointing out the uh, the clear uh, hypocrisy. Uh, someone writes on, on Twitter in Austin Roos, Hey kids, remember all those rules about church where we have to distance and we can't sing and only a few of us can attend at any one time? That's all out the window now. Check out John Lewis's funeral. And um, Matt Walsh uh, writes on his Twitter, We already knew that the coronavirus doesn't infect people at left-wing political demonstrations. It's fascinating to learn that it also doesn't infect people at the funerals of prominent Democratic leaders. This is the most socially conscious virus in, virus in history. Really incredible. And Tucker Carlson also had a piece on this, uh, commented uh, rather on uh, Barack Obama's eulogy uh, at the um, uh, the funeral of John Lewis, where he was talking more so really about political strategy than he was talking about Lewis and his accomplishments and why he should be venerated and uh, and the like, his memory. Continuing on here, the fallout uh, from the pandemic affects uh, uh, women uh, profoundly. Domestic violence, uh, and as well as children, domestic violence surges during quarantine. New study finds. This is from July 30th from the Epoch Times. The unintended consequences of the COVID-19 lockdowns have been severe mass unemployment, increased drug overdoses and suicides, and widespread social unrest. This month, the National Bureau of Economic Research released a paper detailing another increased domestic violence. Analyzing government-mandated lockdowns in India, researchers Saravana Ravandran and Manisha Shah found evidence of a 131% increase in complaints of domestic violence in May in red zone districts or districts that experienced the strictest lockdown measures relative to districts that had less strict measures or green zones. The researchers uh, who used a difference in difference empirical strategy found the increase in domestic violence complaints was consistent with a surge in Google search activity for terms related to domestic violence over the same period. The authors say their findings contribute to a growing literature on the impacts of lockdowns and stay-at-home policies on violence against women during the COVID-19 pandemic. The article goes on to explain how um, there was a over 100% increase of domestic violence documented in Mexico City, for example. So this is not endemic to the United States. It's happening around the world, as most every country uh, has a COVID-19 um, uh, lockdown uh, in some way, shape, or, or form. And um, people are getting frustrated. They're getting pent up. It is a form of, of solitary confinement, which is a, regarded as being a punishment uh, in, uh, in prison. It is not unlike that. Granted, one is still able to communicate with their family and so forth. But I think that there's also a great deal of uncertainty with people being out of work, uh, people being having to close down their businesses. And, uh, and the like. Um, so th this is obviously having a fallout uh, on, in, in the domestic realm uh, between spouses. It is likely also uh, impacting children. Uh, children have a great deal of uncertainty as well. Uh, they realize that their parents uh, have a great deal of anxiety. So there's a lot that is under the surface that is taking place. Uh, this stress, this tension, um, with, with regard to what I would consider to be a very needless and pointless um, lockdown. There are other ways of, of handling this. And this relates to another story here that appeared on Fox News earlier in the week. Um, a tennis, what took place in Tennessee, a, um, a miniature golf center 
uh, that um, a lot of teenagers go to visit to recreate, if you will. Um, there was a riot there because the golf center could not issue refunds promptly uh, to the teenagers. 300 to 400 teenagers began destroying a Tennessee mini golf center because management reportedly did not issue refunds. According to a police report, parents had dropped off large groups of teens at the family play place without supervision, violating coronavirus orders, banning mass gatherings. Well, I think the takeaway to this story is, um, is evidence of the pent-up frustration, the anxiety, the tension that's just lying underneath the surface as a result of these lockdown measures. And we also see this in the social protests that are taking place uh, throughout the country. Uh, you keep people under lockdown orders over the course of several weeks, a uh, few months, and uh, they want to get out and, and cause some havoc, certainly evidence, uh, evidenced here in this particular event. Um, someone threw fireworks into the crowd of 300 to 400 people and uh, a stampede occurred and then people began um, um, ripping the place apart. That from July 27th in Fox News. Another story here uh, concerning the ongoing um, rioting that's taking place. I don't know if we could really classify it as protesting uh, any any longer at this point. Um, since most people have forgotten about the George Floyd uh, incident, um, this one, an article from RT, I've not seen this covered in the U.S. press, Antifa rioters call themselves journalists to avoid federal crackdown. A um, judge in Portland stated that um, journalists cannot be subjected to the same treatment that rioters can be subjected to. And so we have Antifa rioters um, using this as an opportunity, uh, masquerading as journalists with a um, um, phone cam or the equivalent uh, video cam uh, and, um, and avoiding arrest or having an argument uh, against their arrest if they are in fact uh, arrested. The order from the judge has given the rioters an opportunity, um, says a one particular um, um, journalist who is there, Elijah Schaefer, he's described in this article as a right-wing journalist, reported from Portland. He described how rioters will identify themselves as press using that tag as cover to insult and taunt officers Anyone with a $40 handycam mounted on a gas station tripod, he tweets, can call themselves a journalist. And um, finally, in this roundup of stories, an article from The Guardian. Uh, this is based upon a um, study that was done not that long ago concerning uh, the relationship, the, 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 what degree of violence should be attributed to uh, Antifa or the anti-fascists. And The Guardian, which is of course is certainly left of center uh, English publication, um, states the headline is anti-fascists linked to zero murders in the U.S. in 25 years. And there is the concern that the Trump Department of Justice uh, wants to label them a terrorist group. Well, um, and they, they counter by saying that um, there are far more um, incidents of, of murder and, um, and violence attributable to uh, right-wing groups. Well, I would contend that, uh, that the Antifa and the anti-fascists in the United States are really just getting started. Uh, they have... Uh, largely been um, under the radar and uh, they are um, just um, really just beginning here in the United States to gain a foothold and they are a prominent uh, element in uh, this ongoing uh, urban rioting here in the in the US. Um, 
the article points out, new database of nearly 900 politically motivated attacks and plots in the U.S. since 1994 include just one attack staged by an anti-fascist um, that led to fatalities. And some of these, of, of course, are, they may be, uh, quote unquote, lone wolf uh, attacks. Uh, one would have to actually go into the weeds here to determine the significance of things that are being actually uh, classified as attacks, uh, as, uh, as, as acts of violence. Um, there are groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center, the uh, Anti-Defamation League, and their methodologies have over the years been questioned in terms of actually classifying groups as quote unquote white supremacist and uh, and the like. Some of these are simply church groups or conservative groups that pose no real threat uh, to the to the general populace. So anyway, that is a brief roundup of what I've seen that uh, has caught my eye over the past week. Uh, this is the memoryholeblog.org news brief. Hope to be able to do these um, as frequently as I possibly can. I've only done one this week, but perhaps every other day uh, when I am able to find the time to, to call these, uh, to bring these together, and to present these. So until next time, take care. God bless. Bye-bye.